Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, having purpose um, and uh, utilizing purpose in our relationships. Um, so I'm going to start by, uh, I'm going to take you down a YouTube rabbit hole that um, I don't know if I'm embarrassed about this or not, but I've I spent a lot of time watching these videos. Anybody seen these rug restoration videos? It, it's literally a camera set up to, <laughs> I feel so stupid, um, <laughs> to, to watch this person clean a rug that is filthy. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, well, I, I do know, I guess, why I like it. Um, so there's, there's no carpet in my house because I have children and dogs. Um, so like the idea of this thing that just like catches dirt and disease and holds it there forever um, is really gross to me. But uh, these videos, they, they take these rugs that are like, it, it, it starts out as like a rectangle of like black because it's that dirty. There was one I was watching the other day and I'm really sorry if any of you are eating lunch. Um, we don't have cameras on, so I, I can't see, but there was one that had maggots in it someone had put it out in their garden because they didn't want it anymore. And this rug cleaner said, um, I just wanted to test my skills. And it was probably, there was probably like a five inch depth to it. It was one of those like sheepskin uh, type things. And sure enough, you watch this time lapse and it goes from being black and they squeegee out, you know, all the crap and detergent. And it's just this process that they go layer by layer by layer. And it ended up being this like beautiful, white, fluffy, um, something that if I were to see it at a store, I, if, if, if carpet didn't gross me out, I would think about buying it because it looked like new. Um, so I've, I've, uh, my, my, the algorithm on YouTube has, has figured out that I would be interested in this and I am, and I, I watch these rug restoration videos, um, to pass the time. And it got me thinking about like, cause, cause the first time I saw one, I was thinking like, just go buy a new rug. Um, it, it surely would be easier than uh, going through this process or, you know, once you clean all the dirt out of it, can you really, you know, can you really see it as clean and bring it back into your house? And of course you can, um, because you can see after every pass, like the water's coming out cleaner and eventually it comes out clear. And it's, it's maybe more clean than the rug that's been sitting in your living room um, for a while, even though it started out uh, really, really terrible. And um, one of these videos I watched, um, they talked about how the, the reason the reason why this owner wanted this rug clean was because um, it was a family heirloom, and it was something that um, parents who had immigrated from um, you know some other country had brought with them, and it was one of the few things from the old country that this family had. So the purpose was very clear: why we're going to do this gross work, why we're going to put all this work into um into restoring this rug rather than just going and buying something that looks similar to it so it, it got me thinking about as i was as i was wondering what i was going to talk about today it got me thinking about the power of having purpose in your relationship even in the midst of betrayal even when you're dealing with that so that's what we're going to talk about today um i've observed with the couples that i work with uh that betrayal or not the grind of everyday living what's required day to day um, can often obscure what we're about overall. So these are the couples that I work with who, um, you know, they'll say like, oh, we really love each other. And, you know, we've had so much fun together and that's why we're together. And I'll ask, when's the last time you had fun together? And they'll say, well, you know, between the kids bassoon lessons and uh, your work stuff and keeping up with the house, man, we really haven't had time for it. Um, it's not that those day-to-day -day things are unimportant. It's that they've piled on and the purpose of the relationship has become the to-do list itself instead of the to-do list being something that supports what our relationship is about. And um, getting in the grind day-to-day -day or getting in the grind of whatever needs to be done urgently, it can also let in a lot of distractions. I've seen this with a lot of couples in recovery that I work with that, or that come to me after years of, of being in recovery and trying to, to work on it. The, the relationship itself is now about, it's about the betrayal and it's about the recovery. Um, and it becomes this loop, it becomes this circular thing, almost as if um, there, there's, there's nothing left that we're trying to get to on the other end. 
it's just about doing this thing and it becomes really miserable for both parties. It can become really hopeless um, for both parties. So um, I, I think this is a this is a normal phenomenon in any relationship or or even anything that you do on a regular basis. If you if you cannot connect with or don't stay connected to the why are we doing this in the first place, it's really easy to lose sight and it's really easy to get burned out. And it's really easy for things that used to feel like, you know, they gave us energy and purpose and direction that they're just burning us out now. Um, particularly for couples who have been rocked by betrayal, um, I think relationships are prone to this. Um, so what we're uh, having a vision or having a purpose for the relationship is part of the antidote to this. Now, don't misunderstand me. Um, this is not an invitation to bypass um, all of the serious problems and the heartache and the strife um, in your relationship and to say, oh, well, we just have to have a purpose and then we can hold hands and skip through the daisies. It doesn't work that way at all. Um, this is about um, figuring out why you're actually still here. In, in other words, um, relationships need a unifying reason. They need a story that's bigger than the two people um, that are in that relationship. Otherwise, our biology takes over and we go to war with each other. Um, without a, a reason, without a purpose uh, that's bigger than us, um, or without a battle to fight together, so to speak, we, we turn and we fight each other. Um, so in order to get through the hard day-to-day -day things, we have to have a larger vision or a purpose that organizes and gives context to our efforts. So um, apparently a while ago, I signed up for Strava. Um, those of you who don't know what that is, it's, it's a fitness tracking app. Uh, I, should, I should say it's a fitness bragging app um, because what it does is it tracks your activity and then there's like leaderboards. And um, there's a section of trail near my house that... Um, not currently, but for a lot of the summer, I held the local legend um, title on. Um, I don't even actively use Strava. I just get these emails that are like, you're a local legend on the blue ribbon section. And what the blue ribbon section is, is it's this, it's this steep, like four switchbacks up the mountainside that goes to kind of the main trail in my area, the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. Um, which is, you know, it's it's maybe a thousand feet up on the mountainside and uh, you can go forever north and forever south, and it's it's really fun cross country riding. Um, but to get there from my house, I have to go up the Blue Ribbon, um, and um, it's a really it's a hard climb. Um, and I'm not a strong climber. In fact, one of the reasons why I chose this this trail as part of my regular route is because I wanted to get stronger at climbing. Um, I've gotten to the point uh, this summer where I can get to the top of that trail without wanting to throw up. And I don't have to stop my bike and rest for like 10 minutes before I can keep riding. I can actually get off of Blue Ribbon onto the Bonneville Shoreline Trail and I can keep riding now, which is huge progress. Another reason why I've chosen that section is because whether I go north or south, um, after I get to the top, there's some really fun downhill. There's one section, they call it the bobsled, and it's just like a bobsled course, steep banked turns, and it's really flowy. And it's so fun to just ride fast down. And then um, the other direction, it's a really long, slow descent. And so I can get a lot of miles without having to do a lot of work. Um, and it feels really great. Um, every time I'm on that Blue Ribbon Trail and I'm climbing, the question that I'm asking myself or what I'm thinking of is, um, do I want to go north or south when I get off of this? Because either way, it's going to be great. Um, having a vision gives context to our efforts. It helps us know why we're doing the hard thing. What is this all for? Um, I can't count the number of couples that I've worked with where um, the, the partner who's been betrayed, the partner who's discovered betrayal is in the middle of a trigger. And um, their, their spouse who's done the betraying is saying something like, why do I have to be so sensitive right now? Um, why do you need me to slow down? Why do you need me to set aside my own feelings? Um, and I used to make a case for it's good to help your partner when they're in a trigger. And um, that, that didn't work very well or all the time um, to, to get the partner who needed to be sensitive to be sensitive. What I would say is 
how many more times can you be insensitive here before your partner looks at you and says, what am I doing here? If you can't give me this in this moment, why would I stay with you? This is just hurting me. And that I found tends to get people to understand um, that the overall vision isn't just what do we have to do right now and does it annoy me? The overall vision is where are we going after this? If I can get you safely through a trigger, um, it does a lot of things for us. First of all, we're not dealing with a trigger anymore. Second of all, you may uh, develop some trust in me, rightly so, because I got sensitive, um, because I helped you with something that was hard that I caused. Um, and it gets us back to what was good. And that's, that's the whole point of this is, um, relationships function, um, when both parties know why this is a thing. Now, your reason why our relationship is a thing, it doesn't have to be big and grand and Hollywood doesn't have to make a movie of it. It's just that you two have to be really clear on why should our relationship be a thing. Those reasons may be romantic. They may not be. I was working with a guy recently um, who uh, he said, I, I think the chance for they were, he and his spouse were, were older, uh, like in their 70s. He said, I, I think the window for where romance is the most important thing for us is uh, that's kind of closed. That's not what we're about anymore. But he said, um, I really want to have a good last several years of life. And I want her to have that too. I want it to be comfortable. I want it to be enjoyable. And I want us both to be with someone that we love. And that's what he would remember every time he ran into something that, you know, either a trigger from his spouse or a demand from his spouse or whatever it was that would have him, you know, throwing in the towel or acting badly, he would think, is this, is what I'm about to do, is this fitting in the larger picture of, I want us to have good last years together. And more often than not, it was a really effective braking system for him. He could get back on track. Okay, I really don't want to get empathetic right now. I don't really want to slow things down, but I also don't want to throw our dream of the future in the toilet. So the, the vision helps to correct our behavior now. The vision can help us to do the right thing when the right thing is the hardest thing. Um, so knowing why our relationship is a thing um is really important and this has to be outside of the house that we keep together outside of the kids if we have them even outside of our extended families and i would even say it has to be outside of healing betrayal because um all of those things i'm, I'm living proof on this last one um, i don't have to be married to anybody i help people heal from betrayal all the time you don't need a marriage for that to happen you also don't need a marriage to raise kids together you don't need a, a, a union to do a lot of things that people will say, well, this is why we're together. Um, what, what you're looking for ideally is, um, do I have the best deal in the world right here? Could I get what I get with you? What I uniquely get with you? Could I get that anywhere else easily? Um, if you can find those things, or if you can remember those things, um, that's the larger picture. That's the larger vision. I'm not together with you because I owe you, um, because I ran you over with a truck and now I have to make you feel better. I'm with you because when you feel better, um, we get to have this relationship that's full of fun and adventure and, you know, our inside jokes and the sense of humor that nobody else gets. Um, this is like, uh, when I've been, uh, you know, in, in remote places camping um, and uh, it's not uncommon in the early summer in, in some places where I go camping where there's big trees across the road. Um, and these aren't roads that are travel all the time. These are like little dirt tracks, you know, high up in the mountains. And I have two choices at that point when there's a big tree in the road. Um, I can get out my saw or if, if it's uh, if it's possible, I can get enough people out of the car and we can push the tree out of the way or we turn around and we go find another place to camp. Um, I, I ran into a situation like that where you know I talked to my family and I said, it's probably gonna take me about an hour and a half to get this tree out of the way. It's, it's pretty big. Um, do we really want to go to this, this place that we've been planning on? And the answer from everybody is yes, we want to go there. It's worth it. And it was um, really hard work, really annoying work, 
It's the same thing in, in your relationship. There are things you have to do that are hard and annoying that you're not gonna to wanna to do in the moment. If you have a larger vision of where this relationship is going, what it will be able to be once you clear the tree out of the road, once you clear the proverbial tree out of the road, um, that can help you make the right decision about uh, how to do the hard work or why or why not to do the hard work. Um, so even couples going through the hard and necessary slog of recovery need a bigger picture. So what, why are we doing this? Again, it's not a bypass. And it's not necessarily to make you feel ooey gooey about each other. It's to keep you informed, keep you remembering what's actually on the line here. It, it's not just, is our marriage going to stay together or not? It's, are we going to have a chance at what's special between us? Are we going to have a chance at what we, what we both really want out of this? Um, what makes us special? What do we have access to? We can't get anywhere else. Even if the purpose of your relationship, like I said, is not um, exciting or what you hoped it would be right now, it's really important that, that two people get honest and clear about what purpose their relationship serves now. So that even if it's not something that's great, you are an informed consumer. Nobody's under any mistaken impression here. And that purpose can always change. Like, like this man that I, I worked with who said, I want our last years to be good. That's not why he married this person in the first place. That's not why he went looking for love in the first place. Um, but it was, it was a compelling reason for him and his spouse too. She heard it and she said, you know what? I think you're right. And that vision actually sounds really good. I think we could give that to each other. Um, so um, just, just to summarize, um, purpose helps uh, organize us. It helps us do the right thing when the right thing is the hard thing. It helps us remember there's a bigger picture. It can help us get out of the minutia, the slog of the day to day that can be not mind numbing and it can shorten our vision to hear. Um, it can, uh, it can help us to craft what we're doing right now. Well, let's make sure that we're doing things that align with our purpose. If this doesn't align with our purpose, do we really have to do it? Do we really need to do it? Um, or is that us getting into the, the to-do list as the relationship instead of what we create together? So some things to think about with uh, the use of purpose in your relationship. And like I said, uh, you don't have to wait until the betrayal phase is over or the healing from betrayal phase is over. In fact, it can really help early on to remember or to, to set a compass point for the bigger picture. Here's why we're gonna do all this hard work. Because we, we don't think we can get what we have here um, anywhere else. Thank you. Is that it? Yep, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, no, that's all right. Um, um, first of all, um, you have inspired me. I have, a, I have one rug. I kind of feel the way you do. They trap things. But I have two cats. And... Um, they use it for a scratchy pad and they shed and it was just gross so i took it out and rolled it up and it's in the garage now even though it's in the living room and i've been trying to figure out what to do so i may watch some rug cleaning videos and try and save it um we shall see um and i, I love this whole idea of purpose and you you gave you know your, your biking as an example and you know i live about a thousand feet up a mountain and all the good writing is down for me, not up. Um, which means at the end of my ride, I have to come back up the mountain. And it kept me from riding, even though it's roads and not nearly as hard as a switchback trail. Um, to the point where a couple of months ago, I bought an electric assist bike. And I, was, I finally realized the purpose is in this discussion why it was so important for me is I love to ride my bike, not for the same reasons you do. My purpose is entirely different than yours. I'm not challenging myself. I, I like it to be not a lot of work. And I do a lot of, I don't meditate in place. I meditate on my bike. Um, and <laughs> riding up a thousand feet of mountain at the end of a, a ride was just defeating the purpose. Um, but there are other things where I will do the hard work. Um, you know, recovery is hard work. It's hard work for me. Um, and I still do it because I'm very clear about what I want or things I want in my life and, and 
<laughs> if I don't do the hard work of recovery, I will not get those things. Um, so it's, and I love that you also said purpose can change because when I started biking, I had really similar purpose to you. I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to get in shape. I wanted to get better. And, you know, that was 20, 25, 30 years ago. I mean, 56 and uh, it's very different. Um, so thank you. Um, all right, let's get to our Q&A. Um, we have one left over from the previous session that I did with you, which was sometime in July, I believe. But um, oh, so, yeah. let's take the, so let's take this question first. Um, my wayward addict says he lies whenever I ask him about his addiction um, because he's not ready to disclose the truth. He says he wants to tell the truth on his own terms when he wants to, not when I want to hear the truth. We've had multiple instances where he would tell me about porn he watched only after I asked, never on his own. Um, he claims he would have told me eventually, even if I hadn't brought it up. He says, if I don't believe that, there's nothing he can do about it. Um, I don't want to not agree to his terms and scare him back into his lying habits. But then I struggle with feeling like his, requ his request to tell me on his own terms isn't reasonable. What should I do? Yeah, so um, if... If uh, you are two individuals and not a relationship, it's it's fine to say, I'm gonna do this on my terms. The problem or, or the reality is you are a relationship. So um, one, one partner can have uh, their own terms and one partner can have their terms. But if, if those terms do not work both ways, you do not have a relationship. So when it comes to, when it comes to honesty, um, when it comes to telling the truth, especially about a relapse or triggers or anything like that, uh, re remember that um, this kind of relationship, the peer-to-peer, -peer, we're on equal footing, that comes after the damage of betrayal has been healed. Before betrayal has been healed, it is not an equal terms relationship. It's like this. I'm in the doghouse because I messed up. I broke it. I've got to fix it. Um, I, I put this hurt and this fear in you because of my behavior. So I have to be responsible for that. And if part of the medicine for your hurt and fear is um, you need to be able to lift open my head and know what's going on in it at any time, those are the terms. So it sounds to me like in this situation, some things might be confused. Um, first of all, you may not be done with phase one, which is healing the betrayal. Um, in phase one, the person who's done the betraying, they really do need to take a one down position and it's not in order to eat dirt. It's in order to uh, yield, to show that they're willing to yield their own impulse and their own desires to make room for another person in a relationship. It's prerequisite stuff. Um, phase two, again, is where we look together what's best for both of us and we, we co-construct that. Um, even in phase two, uh, it's not a matter of debating. If we run into, oh, I need this and I need this, and we seem to be at odds. Um, if we want the relationship to survive, we have to get creative, not compromising. Compromising is giving up what we want to get less of what we want. <laughs> um, creativity is let's find a structure. Let's find a way where we both get what we want. Um, so I, I think there might be some confusion on, on that front of uh, what, what phase are we in? Um, there's also confusion around just how a relationship works. Not one person sets the terms. In phase one, one person sets the terms because they have a right to leave based on what you've done. They're not setting the terms because that's how the relationship should be. It's you're on probation. Um, and the person who did not violate the basic trust of the relationship gets to set the terms of their probation because it's that person who gets to decide whether or not they want to continue, not the other way around. Of course, the other person can decide, I don't want to continue with this relationship. But uh, if you try to hold that over your spouse's head, um, you've got it backwards. So, so that's, that's, that's what I would say to that um, is um, it sounds like your, 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 your poor spouse there uh, might have it backwards and is trying to hold all the cards when they don't have a right to. And they're going to have to work on that. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times in the in the sex addiction, porn addiction work groups that I teach, I, you know, the guys come with a question like this. I'm like, you violated the relationship boundaries. Your wife's request is reasonable. Given the circumstances, it's beyond reasonable. Yeah. 
give a little here. Um, well, it, and also the whole like you you telling the truth when it serves you best, that might be part of the original problem. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's say this couple is in stage two when they need to get creative. Um, would you suggest something like, okay, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8 p.m., we're going to sit down and we're going to have a, a list of, you know, like a Thanos check-in or something where these things come out so that it's not, you know, randomly at 2 p.m. on a Sunday. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8, 8 p.m. We can both prep for it and, and know that it's coming. Is that yeah. like a typical creative solution or? Yeah, very much so. Um, for those of you who celebrate Christmas or any other holiday, um, if you're not ready for Christmas the day before, what do you do? <laughs> you get ready for it, like because you you can't you can't have the entire world push Christmas off for a couple of weeks because you didn't make the deadline. I, I think that's part of a creative solution is we have a set time, a deadline for both of us where we have to come prepared to speak and we have to come prepared to listen. And so it, it's no surprises. If I do need to get ready to do this on my own terms, it's not that you said to me, here's how we're going to do this. It's we agreed to this. And I know it's going to be hard for me. In fact, good agreements in a marriage, both people have to stretch. Um, so whether we, whether we feel like it two days before or not, we know Friday night is our big check-in. So we both get ready for it because we both agreed to this because it was going to meet both of our needs. You get to know what you need to know that's going on with me. And I get time to prepare so I don't feel like I'm caught off guard um, and I don't feel like I'm under pressure. I agreed to this. So um, yeah, that's, that's a great example of, of that kind of creative solution. I've also seen couples do something like um, when I ask you a question, um, it's okay if you need to take 12 hours, 24 hours um, to collect yourself and gather your response. Um, the key is it, it's, not, uh, it's not an indefinite timeline and we're not just going to ignore it. We do come back, we keep the appointment and the information gets exchanged. There's, there's lots of creative solutions to that. Yeah, and a lot of, a lot of couples have boundaries. Um, if you do something that bi violates our relationship agreement, you have 12 hours to come clean or 24 yeah. hours to come clean. Yeah. Um, or if you tell a lie or keep a secret, you have... 12 hours or 24 hours to come clean. Um, if you wait 23 hours and 59 minutes, I won't get mad at you for delaying. I can still get mad at you for what you did. <laughs> now, if you wait 24 hours and five minutes, I can get mad at both. You know? um, and that's a boundary, again, that both people agree to and they know it's the boundary. So it's it's not so, it doesn't feel so pushy or I, that's not the right word, but um See, you know, see, not, nothing is pushy like when when my um, when my spouse and I hike together and we make it a priority. It's not pushy because it's something we both love and we agree to. We're going to do it twice this week. Yeah. So, so the other morning, uh, or you know, any giving morning, one of us is waking the other up and saying, "Hey, it's hike day. Get out of bed." Yeah. Not pushiness. It's we gave ourselves to this. Um, we again, this is the purpose principle in the relationship. We made something that's higher than both of us. And we're going to hold ourselves to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, let's jump into the Q&A here. Um, my husband recently lost his job. Sorry to hear that. Um, as a sex and porn addict, I realize he has added pressures and have attempted mindfulness and consideration. He's been actively seeking employment, had a couple of decent interviews that sound promising. He had one interview where the employer uh, wanted to hire him, but didn't offer enough for it to be doable for us financially. Um, he is, my husband is also a mother and meshed man of an NPD, narcissistic personality disorder mother. Um, yesterday was his birthday. I made sure to do everything I could to make him feel special and important. Um, his mother called late in the day to wish him happy birthday, he told her about his job search, and she no, showed no reaction to his enthusiasm uh, and instead told him to settle for the job that wasn't going to pay enough. Um, after that conversation, he was arrogant, ungrateful, and immature with me, uh, he was unaccountable for his actions and how he was hurting me, even though he knew um, he was doing it. His disloyalty bind kicks in it after a conversation like that with his mother. Um, what would you say to a mother and mesh man in this couple? Mm, I'm having a hard time answering this question the way that it's asked, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, if, uh, if you're in a relationship with an enmeshed man or you are an enmeshed man 
and um, something goes wrong, uh, something's not working right, um, there's almost no way to approach it without this person feeling like they're being dragged to the principal's office. So um, if, if the spouse, if, if the enmeshed man in this situation um, wants some guidance, I would love to hear from him and I would talk to him directly because to, to address this, to get out of this, um, he has to activate himself. You wanting it for him is not enough for him. You setting the scene uh, beautifully as you did here. here. Here's all the things that are going on. What do we do about this? Um, without that self-activation, this is gonna bring up more of that, uh, I mean, you call it arrogance, um, you call it immaturity. It's gonna, it's, it's gonna be a push for anything that I say here. So I guess what I would say here is if, if this enmeshed guy is listening, uh, if he's watching this at any time, um, if you wanna work this out, if you want some guidance on this, um, jump on and submit what you wanna know. And um, for, for the spouse who wrote this, um, I, I really am not trying to be insensitive and I'm not trying to shut you down. I understand the pain that you're in and I understand the desperation to have this addressed. Um, I understand totally why, why you would submit this question, why you would ask for guidance, why you'd ask me to speak directly to your partner. Um, it working this way isn't going to get either of you what you want. Um, and I would, I would say to you, the spouse who wrote this, um, it might be helpful for you to consider changing the line from, um, let me, let me get the advice to then bring back to you to say, Hey, um, I'd really like you to jump on and, and take a look at this. And maybe you've done that a million times and it hasn't worked. And if that's the case, I'm so, so sorry. Um, but I, I, I think there's a bigger, I think there's a bigger thing to address here than what do I say in this situation? And it's the overall, um, if, if you're the enmeshed man um, who is stuck here, if you're the enmeshed man who's feeling the bind, um, activate yourself to address it instead of uh, acting out. Um, the pain is very real and I, I totally get the, the tendency to run away from it. Um, but the running or, or the staying stock still uh, isn't going to get you anything closer to what you want um, than you already have. So that's, that's how I'd answer that. I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I couldn't uh, directly give what's being asked for there. Yeah, um, I popped a book in the chat feature by uh, Dr. Ken Adams. Uh, it's called When He's Married to Mom, I believe. Um, and that one's written for basically wives of mother and mesh men, is it not? Uh, there, there's a chapter for the spouses. That one's actually okay. written for mesh men. It's, it's useful for both. Okay. All right. Um, and then I will add again, which I mentioned earlier, uh, John teaches mother and mesh men workshops um, with and for Ken Adams. Um, and um, I believe you're doing those both in person and online these days. Yep, yep, we're we're doing both. Um, and uh, the the online format um, is just as effective as the in person, which I mean, it cuts out like a day and a half of travel. Yeah. Um, and, and the expense, uh, some of the expense and all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it, it makes it really, really accessible. I'll actually. I'll, I'll say just a little bit more on this. I, I talked to a guy just the other day um, who maybe maybe in a similar situation um, to this, he had said, my wife has read everything and now she wants me to read everything. And he was really mad about this. <laughs> um, and, and I could imagine why. Um, I, I think having somebody who it, it's maybe hard to be vulnerable with in the first place for you, having somebody, you know, whispering in your ear about what your issues are, uh, that, that's hard. But I said to him, if you're feeling disadvantaged by that, if you're feeling like sh she's got the upper hand, read the stuff yourself. Um, why don't you become the expert on this? So that you could either address the issues that, that are your own if, if you identify with the material here um, or you can put the concern to bed and you can instead of just in a reactionary way saying no this is not the issue 
you could say, I don't think this is my issue. And here's the reasons I've actually looked closely at the issue here. Here's where my story differs. And you could actually present a, a cohesive argument, a, a thought out argument instead of just the gut reaction. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to plug the work, your workshops one more time for mother and mesh men. I know a couple people who've done this workshop and it was life-changing uh, for them. So I haven't done it. I probably should, <laughs> but, but the people I know who've done it um, have raved about it. So yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Hi guys. Thanks for being here. I'm the wife of a sex addict in treatment two years out from D-Day. What is a psychosexual evaluation and what should be included on a psychosexual uh, evaluation? Yeah, we call it the biopsychosexual social, I think, at Seeking Integrity, but I'll let John yeah. answer that question. Yeah, Scott, I might, I might need some of your assistance in the what should be included. Because um, uh, so, so a psychosexual evaluation, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's looking more for um the propensity for uh criminal type or deviant type uh, yeah like straight up psychosexual is the, and that's why we use the biopsychosexual social which is much yeah. more of a holistic thing which i yeah. think is probably what's being asked about here yeah so the, so the biopsychosocial uh sexual it, it would again like scott said it's more holistic it would take in the whole person not just what is their propensity for potentially illegal or dangerous sexual behavior um, but what it essentially gets at what we call the arousal template. What makes this person tick the way that they do and, and how do they tick? What, what's the scene? What, uh, or what what's the scene we're looking at? Um, what, what, are, what are the things that are, are meaningful, connected sexually? What are the patterns of behavior? Um, it, it's a way of, uh, getting like the 30,000 foot view, um, which then can inform, um, specific parts of treatment. So, uh, for, for example, with just the straight psychosexual um, evaluation, if I have someone who has done anything that even borders with like illegal or, you know, underage stuff, I have them get that because it, it helps me see below the surface. Yeah. I don't do it myself. These are things that are actually done um, with people who are trained in, in that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Anything you would add to that, Scott? Yeah. I mean, we do... When people come to Seeking Integrity, we have them fill out a couple of um, evaluations online, even before they arrive, so that we don't have to waste time when they get here. We use the sexual dependency inventory, which I'm sure you use with your clients as well. Um, it was prepared by Dr. Pat Carnes. It's it's long and it really digs into, as as John said, the arousal template and the behaviors. Um, it gives the therapist a really good overview. Um, of what's happening um and it's also it's redundant with itself in a lot of ways which kind of prevents lying um or at least cuts down on it um you know we, then there's you know the initial interview um and there's a look at you know the family history of the current history and uh it needs to be holistic um if you're treating sex addiction because you know sex addiction is more than just one thing it's an entire life pattern pattern of behaviors that support the addiction there's a lot of stuff that has to be dealt with um, you know if offending behaviors um, are often travel with sex addiction but not always and they can be very very different there are multiple types of sex offenders this is actually an area of expertise for me um, you know if somebody has offending behaviors we will professionally evaluate them for that we'll use the able screening test a couple of others um, looking at risk of recidivism, how they're gonna to respond to treatment, things like that. So there's a lot that goes into this, but from a sex addiction treatment standpoint, it's, it's a holistic view of the person's life because we're treating more than just the addiction. We're treating the addiction and the underlying issues, which are trauma yeah. and the family issues that are past and current. And, 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 and it, you know, it's, it's a huge process and and like the biopsychosocial sexual is a huge you know i mean our interviews take a couple of hours just the interview and that's after a pre-interview before somebody even comes to treatment plus the documents that they fill out online um 
So everything, it should include everything. Yeah. <laughs> short answer. Yeah, it's, it's like, I mean, it, it's, it's as foundational as like, if you were gonna go in for an operation or you're getting screened for disease, you, you'd get like, you'd get basic blood panels. It's not just the what's going on with your thyroid. It's it's how might that be affecting everything else? And is there another explanation? Is it really the thyroid? So it's 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 getting the big picture. Because I'll, I'll often find with my clients, it's not that their chief complaint or what they come into therapy for. It's not that it's wrong. It's just like this big of the picture. And so it, it helps, like Scott said, um, if you really want to get at treating the whole person and get at underlying causes, you have to have more than just what's going on in your addiction or what went on in your addiction last week, what led up to you getting caught. You really have to see the, the big picture. Yeah. And you just brought up an interesting point too. It, it, there could be something else going on, which is why we screen for all of this. And you probably run into this more than most CSATs is somebody who's not sexually addicted will be told often by a family member or a spiritual leader or somebody like that, that while well, you're engaging in this behavior, you must be addicted. And then they end up in your office and you screen them first and foremost to make sure they're a sex addict, right? Okay. And, and if they're not, you might treat them, you'll, you will treat them very differently or you'll refer them to someone who can provide a different type of treatment. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. Um, okay, can you please type that up? The how many times do you have to be insensitive quote? Um, can you repeat that? Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's how many more times can your partner afford you to miss this one, to be insensitive here? Yeah. Um, be, because there, there really are consequences to missing the boat. So I, I say that to get the the partner who is struggling with the empathy to start thinking that this isn't this isn't discrete here. It's not like oh we're having a hard time here. It's this is a larger pattern, and this is part of what your partner is looking for in healing. Not can you kiss my boots now? That's not what it's about. It's about can you internalize me and can you get sensitive to me? Because in in the entirety of your addiction, you weren't. You were thinking about you, even if you were acting like you were thinking about me because you kept secrets, because you betrayed, you were thinking about you. So can you show me how many more times can your partner put that out there? I need you to see me and you miss it before your partner says, what am I doing here? I don't want this anymore. You have nothing to offer me. Um, thank you. Okay, so this is, um, I'm not gonna type that out, but we will post the webinar and you can listen to that yet again. Um, so this this goes back to the mother and mesh man couple, and this is the male. Um, Yay! Thanks <laughs> yeah. for getting on. Um, I have read the books by Dr. Adams. Yay! Um, uh, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, frankly, my mother isn't capable <coughs> of giving me validation or empathy. I've known this for over twenty five years. Um, I'm interested at this point to help my wife heal from her, tra her trauma and work through mine without triggering her uh, in any way or further. I mean, I'm sorry, you're going to work through your trauma, you're going to trigger your wife, uh, and vice versa. Um, but lovely thought. Um, with everything going on at this point, how can I best handle this situation? Thanks, Scott and John. Um, Thank so you. This oh, is a ahead. guy who wants to do the work. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you for jumping on. I just, I just want you to notice how, how different the take is here. And it's not that your spouse had it wrong in the first place. It's that for you to get help, you, you have to deal with what's relevant to you, not through the lens of, of your wife and what's relevant to her. It's not that that's not important. I, I would go as far to say is if, if you keep taking it that way, um, you've made her your mother. And my guess is she doesn't want to be. Um, so the more you activate yourself, the more you put in this and you ask the questions, okay, what's going on here? What can I do about this? Um, the, the better the help is going to be for you. So again, thank you so much uh, for, for jumping on here. I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you took that risk. Um, to, to Scott's point, lovely idea to get through your trauma without triggering your spouse in any way, not going to happen. It's just not. Um, that, that's the nature of a bonded relationship. You're going to feel things from each other. You're going to see things from each other. So um, 
so some things that I would I would encourage in that direction. Um, how can you get through your work without discounting that your spouse is triggered and having a hard time? Can you both have a hard time together? Can you both be in pain at the same time? Um, again, with a lot of the mesh guys that I work with, that's like a language they don't speak because that's not how it was with their mothers. I couldn't be in distress if it put you in distress, mom. So I stopped being in distress. It's I'm centered around your emotions, your feelings. And again, this is not your spouse's doing. This is, this is that I have this internal template and I make everybody that I'm close to my mom. Um, Cause that's, that's the legacy of mother enmeshment. Um, so, so the first thing that I would say there is work on your guilt about being a burden and leaving an impact in somebody else's life. You were supposed to leave an impact in someone else's life from day one. You were supposed to have needs without being made to feel small or guilty about them. Um, and if you didn't get that, um, it's not that your spouse reparents you, it's that you get to claim it as an adult now. Um, so, so that'd be my first bit, uh, bit of advice. The, the other part about handling the ongoing situation, I'll tell you a story that um, a guy in my, my enmeshment workshop just this last week told. So um, he, he had time before the Zoom call started for the day, and this was our last day. So he went fishing. He liked fishing. And he told his group during his check-in, um, said, I'm, I'm there fishing, and my phone starts buzzing, and I pull it out of my pocket, and it's my mom. My mom is calling me. And um, he said, I'm really, really glad that I was in um, I was in the workshop because I stopped and I noticed how I was feeling. And I said, gosh, this makes me really, really anxious. So I sat there watching the phone buzz and I felt my anxiety. And then he said, I noticed almost immediately I started going into the obligatory guilt, which is, gosh, I should really pick up the phone. I know she's going to want me to visit her when this is over. I told her, you know, I was tied up for the weekend and. Uh, we probably weren't going to be able to get together. I know she's going to want that. She's going to push for that. And then he started thinking about, you know, what he could do to alleviate the guilt. And this is what he said. I wrote it down. He said, my obligatory guilt was a choice to not face my anxiety. And he said, I decided that rather than have my head go through the obligatory guilt and what do I do to make this better? He said, I'm just going to face my anxiety. And he sat there th through the end of his mom calling. He didn't answer the phone, but through the end of the phone buzzing. And he just said to himself, this makes me so anxious. I'm so afraid of what's going to happen next. And then it stopped and his screen went blank and he breathed and he threw his line back in the water and he let himself come down from the anxiety. So best handling this situation. Um, th there's a couple things. Um, that I would say here is, first of all, re-examine those boundaries about contact with your mom. If you've known this for 25 years, that she can't give validation or empathy, and that devastates you, you might want to look at, at how your guilt and obligation keep you picking up the phone, rather than you dealing with how bad it sucks that your mom can't give you the love that, that she ought to, or that you need. Um, so, so that would be the first, uh, bit of advice that I would have there. Um, the next is the, the current trigger, um, again, make it really simple, um, cut away how annoyed you might be with your spouse right now, cut away how hurt you might be by your mom. And again, get back to what does it feel like to be in my skin right now? Um, you might want to write out some, some journal entries about that. You might want to write about how that feels. You might want to draw a picture of what it feels like so that you can start validating um, and dealing with the feelings that are in you. With a lot of the enmesh men that I work with, um, they can create or they can let crises go out of hand because it keeps them away from their feelings. They feel guilty having those. They feel guilty being sad. Gosh, I would imagine on your birthday, um, seeing your mom's number pop up on your phone, that might've ruined your whole day. And I could imagine you feeling guilty about that because maybe you're noticing like the people around me are really trying to make this a great day and my mom just ruined it. Um, let yourself have that if that was the case. Let yourself mourn that. Not what birthdays should be like. Um, just I, And again, to, to cap that off, I would say may, maybe take a look at how everything that you've been doing in response is to avoid that original feeling. Deal with the original feeling. 
And, and again, like Scott did earlier, I would just I plug the workshop. That's what the workshops are for, is to give you space and time to get to the original feeling instead of running around and creating and putting out all these other fires that keep you away from feeling. And again, I'll, I'll just say it like, like this guy in the workshop said that my obligatory guilt was a choice I made not to face my anxiety. I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's great stuff. You know, enmeshment begins when the child exists to meet the needs of the mother, and yeah. it should be the other way around. So, yeah. mother enmeshed men, myself included, um, you know, our purpose as kids was to meet mom's needs. So we stopped having needs, um, and stopped express. Not we didn't stop having needs. We stopped expressing them and trying to get them met. Um, and this impacts us in a hundred different ways. And one of the ways that's very common is we become sex addicts. And there's a whole, I think, psychology behind that, that, that we don't have time to get into. Um, you know, I've known for 25 years as well that my mother cannot meet my needs. She simply cannot do it. She cannot validate me. She can't provide empathy. She can't. Um, you know, one of the things I've had to do is accept that. Um, and and stop trying. <laughs> um, well said. You know, and, and you know, I can still be there for her, but I don't have to get emotionally wound up in her anymore. She's an adult, and there are times where I say, "Mom, you're an adult. Handle this yourself." Um, you know, I'm two thousand miles away. I can't car shop for you because you drove your car into a three foot deep puddle and it's totaled now, which she did last month. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I made her go buy her own car. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, but, um, you know, I had to, you know, since we're talking about having purpose and use like, utilizing the relationships, I had to redefine the purpose of my relationship with my mother um, and the purpose of my relationship with everyone else. Um, you know, I had to reorganize uh, the priorities and, and recognize my purpose is to get what I can out of my relationship with my mother, not what I'd like to get out of my relationship yeah. with my mother, because that ain't coming. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, we are out of time. Um, it did ruin the day. Um, it was never about me. It was always about her. And I have stopped trying. So you're learning on this. I, I still recommend the, the, the workshop if you can do it. Um, so thank you, everybody. John, great topic. And um, I love when we get into enmeshment because you just explain it so unbelievably well. So thank we, you. We need to do another enmeshment specific one of these. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? Um, why, don't you, why don't we email and we'll set a date and we can promo it. And because um, I think we had uh, over 100 people last time we did that, which was cool. So, yeah. okay, everybody, thank you. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, have a good day. I will get this one posted this afternoon because I know there's stuff that people are, are going to want to hear again. So, thanks, everybody. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>